jungle boat cruises, cave walks, a titanic walkthrough attraction, and even sculptures made from human teeth. These are just some of the attractions that Australian theme parks of the past have boasted among their lineups. Australia has always had a weird and wacky collection of tourist attractions, and some of these theme parks of the past are no exception. So let's talk about some former Australian theme parks that might give you a fond jog down memory lane. There are far too many defunct Australian theme parks to talk about, and many deserve a video of their own. So this will be the first video in a series about defunct Australian theme parks and attractions. In this first video, I've chosen one defunct amusement park from every state that you might remember. So sit back, relax, and let me know which ones I've missed or which ones you remember in the comments so that I can include them in a future episode. From Queensland, Magic Mountain in Nobby Beach. Before SeaWorld, Movie World, and DreamWorld were even thought of, the Gold Coast's premier theme park was Magic Mountain. Situated atop a small mountain in the Gold Coast suburb of Nobby Beach, this park operated from 1962 until its closure in 1987. The park began in the early 1960s when Paige Newman built a chairlift to the top of the outcrop, building a small cafeteria at the top. This gamble ultimately paid off, as the unique attraction drew 40,000 people to ride the chairlift in just its first year of operation. Aiming to capitalize on the interest, Paige Newman added a magic castle, giving the park a magic theme and officially naming it Magic Mountain. Kids during the sales and family fun at Magic Mountain are free to kids during the school holidays. Every super ride and show is free, including the magical visions. And the new water playground Splashdown is free too. There's even free transport along the Gold Coast on our fun double-decker bus. So the best value holiday entertainment must be Magic Mountain, cause one kid's free with each paying adult. Magic Mountain, open Sunday to Thursday, 10 till 5, at the center of the Gold Coast. The park quickly exploded in popularity, and it wouldn't be long before the chairlift was accompanied by other rides and attractions. In 1976, Paige Newman sold the park to a man named George Carrot, who had operated until 1982. In turn, George Carrot sold the park to a new owner that year. By this time, Dreamworld and SeaWorld had opened, turning the Gold Coast into a booming theme park destination. The new owner saw an opportunity, and opted to invest $13.6 million to extend the theme park and make it one of the large players in the Gold Coast's amusement industry. The park in its heyday featured a carousel, cheroplanes, dodgem cars, a parachute drop tower, a magic show in a theatre, a show of old black and white silent movies, and various other rides and attractions for the kids. With its setting atop a large rocky outcrop adjacent to the beach, it featured one of the most unique skylines of any park in the world. However, the blessing of the Gold Coast's new theme park industry was also a curse. As SeaWorld and DreamWorld began to add newer and more attractive rides and attractions, attendance struggled, and in 1987 the operators closed Magic Mountain for refurbishment while they considered the future of the park and how best to keep it competitive against the other nearby parks. Ultimately, they decided that it just wasn't worth the fight, and the promised refurbishment never happened. The site remained derelict and unused until 1991, when the land was sold off, cleared, and subdivided. The unused site was, however, featured in an episode of the remake of Mission Impossible in 1989, so Queenslanders nostalgic for the park can still see footage of it in those episodes. It is now the site of restaurants, shops, and the Magic Mountain Resort Apartments. A nearby street was also renamed to Chairlift Avenue in memory of the park's most famous attraction. Meanwhile, the Parachute Tower was the only attraction to live on, being moved to Australia's Wonderland. But obviously, it has since been demolished. From New South Wales, Fantasy Glades in Port Macquarie. Opened in 1968, this family-run park was started by the Whittaker family and was a staple of the coastal town of Port Macquarie right up until 2002. The Whittakers started the park as their retirement. Both had a form of dwarfism and wanted to create a place where, to quote a local historian, little people like themselves could feel safe. Located on a unique plot of land in forest opposite Shelley Beach, the park was themed to various fairy tales and featured several attractions targeted at young children and their families. 
Examples include Cinderella's Castle, a large pink castle with a walkthrough attraction inside that featured life-size animatronic displays of the story of Cinderella. This walkthrough also led upstairs to a viewing point from the castle's parapet. There was also a similar attraction called the Witch's Cottage, where a witch would be animated stirring a cauldron surrounded by spiders and other creepy crawlies. Apparently, this attraction was considered to be much too frightening for many children. Most of the park's attractions were similar, push-button animated scenes of fairy tales, although the park would later add a human-powered monorail that wound through the surrounding forest, various coin-powered rides and attractions, and the infamous dragon, a large pink dragon who was activated by infrared motion sensors and would spray water and smoke at passers-by. The park became famous for its magical atmosphere and attention to detail, with new animated scenes and attractions continually being added to bring variety to the park. It became one of the most popular attractions in Port Macquarie, garnering over 3 million visitors over its lifetime. However, in 2002, the park closed down when George and Pat Spry, who had purchased the park from the Whitakers, retired, and the land was listed for sale on Gumtree for around $600,000. Locals have fought hard to retain the park in its current state in the hopes that it may reopen at some stage in the future. Unfortunately, vandalism and damage to the buildings has left the park in a run-down state, and it would be quite the investment to rejuvenate the park at this stage. There are calls for the land to be purchased by the state government and turned into a nature reserve, but currently, while landowners do their best to act as caretakers of the remains of the park, it continues to be at the mercy of nature and vandals. After 35 years of being one of the most popular regional parks on the coastal stretch between Sydney and Brisbane, Fantasy Glades now sits in limbo, sometimes rumoured to be reopening and sometimes rumoured to be up for demolition. But for now, it sits in the forest as a sad reminder of a time gone by. From Victoria, Wobby's World in Vermont South. Opened by owner Robin Laurie in the late 1970s, Wobby's World was a transportation themed park with a very interesting reputation. The park was a small one targeted mostly at young children and featuring custom built attractions themed to various forms of transport. Some of the highlights of the park included a helicopter-themed monorail circuit, six-wheeler ATVs powered by lawnmower engines, a small water ride similar to those jumping single-rail log flumes seen in Europe, and a real helicopter that was refurbished into a simulator ride. The park's most popular attractions, however, were real vehicles, including small bobcats dubbed the Wobcats that guests could drive, a real tractor, and, get this, a real gun carrier from World War II. The gun carrier had no actual guns on it, but this was considered to be one of the most popular attractions at the park. I mean, can you imagine basically driving a real tank as a kid? Of course it was popular. The park featured trams, trains, fire engines, and so much more. But while Wobby's World was incredibly popular with locals, it also garnered something of a notorious reputation. Stories of the park include how the helicopter monorail would shudder and wobble every time it turned a corner, threatening to teeter off the rail. The helicopter simulator was deemed very homemade and unimpressive for anyone but the youngest riders. Many of the rides were considered either boring or potentially dangerous. The result of this reputation was summed up in a parody ad on the Melbourne-based TV sketch comedy show, The Late Show, in which its famous TV ads were spoofed in a recurring sketch called Piss Week World. Hey mum, are you looking for somewhere different to take the kids? Are you tired of the usual places? Are you aware that you're overacting? Well, why not bring the kids along to Piss Week World? We've got everything for the young and young at heart. Take a ride on our giant water slide. Venture into our spooky haunted tent. 
Oh, hang on tight for our super flying fox. There's just so much to do at Pissweek World. Take a spin in one of our high-speed supermarket trolleys. Visit our wild animal sanctuary. Or just get touched up by a 43-year-old man dressed as an ill-defined cartoon character. Pissweek World, where every week is Piss Week. These sketches consisted of low-budget TV commercials for a chain of parks with a variety of disappointing rides. But for every critic of Wobby's World, there were a dozen people who loved it for its charm. Unfortunately, however, it would meet its demise in 1999. The park had begun to deteriorate through the 1990s, and as popularity dwindled and the park struggled to meet the costs of upkeep, the operators attempted to increase the entry prices and charge separately for certain attractions in order to keep the business afloat. This was met with criticism and ultimately led to the park's closure. After closing, a plant nursery was opened on the land, which still featured the entrance gate, concrete castle, bridges, train station and mini golf course from the park. However, this nursery has since closed and the land is now occupied by the Forest Hill Police Station, which opened in 2013. Wait a second, if you'd like to support the channel, there is one really, really good way that you can do so. Scan this QR code and either buy me a coffee for just, you know, five bucks, or you can become a channel member. Channel members get exclusive content and access to park merch giveaways and so much more. Big thanks to all the new members from November whose names are now on the bottom of the screen. Become a December member today. Back to the video. From Tasmania, Serendipity Fun Park in Devonport. Tasmania's most famous closed park is one that is shrouded in mystery after only operating for 16 short months. Located on the banks of the Mersey River in Devonport, Serendipity Fun Park was a small family fun park that opened in 1987. Developed at a cost of more than a million dollars, it featured go-karts, a terrifying looking flat ride called the Scat, dodgem cars, bumper boats, and Tasmania's only roller coaster in history, a small steel wild mouse. Originally developed by a Devonport businessman named Barry Lee, the park opened in November 1987 and seemed to be immediately popular. However, after the operators ran into a cash flow problem and could not get assistance from the state government, the park closed after only just over a year of operation. Unfortunately, things would only go from bad to worse for the owners as the park failed to sell at a public auction. There is a lot of local activism to bring back the park, which currently has its land occupied by a small mini golf course. But the park's mysterious and sudden closure has also led to myths and ghost stories about the park. Urban legends have swirled about the park closing due to the death of a teenage boy who drowned in the bumper boats pool after breaking into the park outside of operating hours with his friends. However, all of these legends are completely unsubstantiated and just a side effect of the park's mysterious nature in the memories of Devonport locals. What's most sad for Tasmanians is that there hasn't truly been another amusement park in Tasmania since, despite state government interest in increasing both the tourism potential and population of the island state. Perhaps one day we will see Serendipity revived, or perhaps a new amusement park investment somewhere in Tasmania. From South Australia, Magic Mountain in Glenelg. Close to the former site of Luna Park Glenelg, the original operating grounds of Luna Park Sydney's first rides, a new theme park opened in 1982 named Magic Mountain. Featuring an iconic mountain and waterfall facade, this park was more popular with locals than tourists, featuring four water slides that wound around the mountainous exterior of the building, dubbed as the largest water slide complex in the Southern Hemisphere at the time. The park was predominantly indoors and was set up like a gaming arcade, with rides and attractions being purchased using the park's own unique tokens. The attractions inside included pinball machines, a shooting gallery, bumper boats, dodgem cars, sky cycles, and the four water slides. Despite many criticisms that the building looked like a giant dog dropping, many locals who enjoyed the rides would visit in order to have a nice day out, with Glenelg Beach directly outside. The park would see thousands of visitors every summer and became an Adelaide institution. However, its demise would come at the hands of property developers. In 1997, the Hold Fast Shores development plan was signed with the state government, including proposals for multi-story apartment blocks, a hotel, and other developments along the Glenelg waterfront. This would spell the doom of Magic Mountain, but it wouldn't go down without a fight. 
In 2003, a public opinion survey in the lead up to the local council elections showed that Magic Mountain was incredibly popular and that locals strongly opposed its closure as part of the new development plan. This directly caused the council to rethink their support of the new plan, sparking some hopes that the park may survive the development. The council campaigned to oppose the plan, focusing on Magic Mountain as the one parcel of land under council control. However, they were ultimately unsuccessful. Magic Mountain closed for the last time in July 2004, being demolished soon afterwards. The new development would see it replaced by The Beach House, an indoor fun park with a similar but larger setup to Magic Mountain, featuring water slides, dodgem cars, bumper boats, mini golf, a train, and arcade games, as well as a historic carousel, but without the charming facade. The Beach House opened in 2006 and continues to operate today. And from Western Australia, Atlantis Marine Park in Two Rocks. This theme park, built in 1981 in the small fishing community of Two Rocks, about 60 kilometres north of Perth, still has remains on the site today. The land was purchased by Alan Bond in the 1970s with the intention of building a large resort and residential area called the Sun City Plan. Aiming to capitalise on Perth's exponential growth, Bond opened the Atlantis Marine Park. It's happened. The launch of the greatest spectacle the West has ever seen. Atlantis. Atlantis Marine Park is open. An aquatic extravaganza for all the family. See the incredible dolphins, the performing seals, the sea lions, the sharks, exotic fish. A multi-million dollar marine showcase that will take your breath away. Atlantis at Yanship Sun City, open now. Its signature attraction was seven locally caught bottlenose dolphins who were trained as performers for the next 10 years. The dolphin show was an elaborate and impressive choreographed interaction between dolphins and trainers with various themes such as safari, Incan, Wild West, Three Musketeers and Roman themes. The shows would include trapeze artists and a world first stunt in which three performers would ride four dolphins together in unison. Touted as a cross between SeaWorld and DreamWorld, the park was visited by over 13,000 people in its first few days of operation. As well as the dolphins, the park featured seal shows, water slides, roller coasters, paddle boats, and a souvenir shop, as well as an oceanarium with fish, rays, turtles, and sharks. Its centerpiece was a 10 meter tall limestone statue of King Neptune built by artist Mark Labuse as well as various other quirky ocean-themed artworks and sculptures, even including the disembodied head of Jacques Cousteau. But as well as being the park's most controversial aspect, the dolphins would cause the park its most significant headache. When three calves were born in captivity in 1988, the park began to run into significant financial and legislative issues. With increasing awareness of animal rights and the ethical treatment of animals in captivity, Legislation for dolphin enclosures had changed, and the park was required to build a larger area for its dolphins with the increase in its population. Unable to find the resources to do so, the park's operators, the Tokyo Corporation of Japan, were left in a tricky situation, being unable to legally house the dolphins, while also being unable to ethically release them, with all of the dolphin population being either born in captivity or having lived in captivity for the last 10 years. With the cash flow from the park already dwindling, the corporation made the decision to close the park in 1990, entering an agreement with marine park veterinarian Dr. Nick Gales. In return for releasing the park from its financial obligation for the dolphins, the park left the dolphins in Dr. Gales' care and gave him permission to attempt to reintroduce the dolphins back into the wild. This would prove a challenging task, as the captive-born juveniles had never hunted in the wild and displayed difficulty in learning to forage. The story has a tragic ending. Three of the dolphins ultimately proved to be incapable of living in the wild, displaying no natural instincts for hunting or self-preservation, and constantly seeking human interaction for food, even when it was discouraged. The dolphins were recaptured and moved to Underwater World, now the Aquarium of Western Australia, where they could be cared for. In late 1999, all three of the dolphins died in quick succession for unknown reasons. As for the other dolphins, there have been no confirmed sightings since 1992, although there are occasional urban legends from local fishermen of running into unusually friendly dolphins. As for the park, the sculptures remain in place. 
They were vandalised regularly until in 2015 when volunteers refurbished the King Neptune statue, reopening the area to visitors and keeping the statue as a monument to what once was. I hope that these amusement parks have given you a trip down memory lane, or that maybe you've learned something new. Please let me know in the comments if you'd like to hear about more defunct Aussie attractions that you remember, as there are many more that I would love to discuss in a future video. Thank you so much for watching, please consider liking and subscribing, and I will see you next time.